was well, born and raised in Wembley, Northwest London. Um, born and raised on a council estate, which is something I'm proud of. To be honest, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it teaches you a lot very quickly. Um, so yeah, I, my school is actually literally uh, three minutes across the road from me. Um, in terms of my interest in tech, that came from my brothers. Um, they were always um, taken apart and um, and uh, building like computers. And I always I was like the youngest brother, so I was always asking them like oh, what they were doing, like why why are they like taking things apart? What does that actually mean when you when you're opening up a computer? What does the stuff inside it do? So I attribute a lot of that um, early interest to my my brothers. Um, and in terms of at school. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Preston Manor is a uh, where, where I went. Is it was a bit of a state school. It's a bit of a, a mixed bunch, right? So you had um, we we had everything. You had people who were very smart and like got their grades. We also had people who were um, like out part of gangs. It was it's it's a it's part of the neighborhood of living in Brent, right? It's one of the most um, uh, what's the word socially economically deprived boroughs, um, close to Tama Hamlets as well, which is another area which, well, not when I say close to, not physically close to, but I mean close to in terms of uh, statistically, um, in terms of um, uh, relative poverty. So that doesn't make a, a surprise that you see gangs and stuff. So that that was kind of um, being part of Preston Manor. In terms of people who study in, um, uh, if you like, uh, ICT and uh, computing, no, no one who looked like us was, was doing that. So I was the only black kid in my um, in my IT class when it got to A level. Yeah, I was the only only one. Uh, for me though, one thing I was very clear about is I didn't really care what other people thought of it. Because let's face it, in 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 our community before recently, a lot of people would see tech as the 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 nerdy uncool thing to do it's only since Elon Musk and uh, Jeff Bezos have got some money now everyone wants to be interested in seeing why they're making so much money um so yeah I, I, was, I was part of the the craze of when when people were like, like oh what the hell are you doing that for that's like for geeks and nerds but for me it was always something that was interesting to me like ever since a young age I always wondered how things work that then transitioned into um software development so like building websites and stuff like that I just like the fact that I could change something on a computer and it could actually make something completely change for like everyone um, who viewed the website. I thought that was actually quite powerful in terms of if, if I can change a color, what else could I change on there, right? What else could you do with that in terms of um, changing what things look like for multiple people? I thought that was actually really cool. Um, but then, yeah, after after that, um, I, I just became, I was always interested in the power of like using um, technology to to build and scale things. And then from that, I've always done like an inter I did an internship as part of the well, I've joined the Amos Bertry, did an internship since every year since I was like 16. Um, so yeah, that that I guess that takes you to from my childhood I guess to the starts of um interning. What what gave you the the ability to to um have that 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 strong mind and and not allow the your, your peers to um stunt your, your your growth and your, and your progress you know what that's a great question um and it's the question i don't actually get often which i think is very important um and i think it's it's partially trial and error but it's also partially something my mentor told me and she always used to say like the role of the 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 journey of a leader is a very lonely one and she always she told me that very early um and it's my mentor her name is joy and she, she said this very early in in, in my question like she goes, you need to realize that not everyone will understand what you're doing. Not everyone will um, necessarily follow you down the path. And she, 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 she always used to say, be comfortable being the only one there, because it usually means you're the person who's actually the leader. So that was, that was for me, one of the most comforting things. But it, to us, there was times where it was, it was hard in terms of everyone else was just trying to just, like it, it, we're 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 from we're born and bred London, born on the council state. Everyone's up to everything. Let's just put it that way, um, without incriminating anyone. Everyone's up to everything. So um, so it is difficult when like you're you're you grew up in the same place as a lot of these people, and then they see you like you're going to computing class, you're talking about computers and stuff. They're like, this guy's a nerd. What is this this nonsense that he he keeps talking about? Like, and that people used to try and downplay it in a way but I don't know it's something in my character which is a bit 
I guess my mum would call it my stubbornness, which is that I, I, I don't really care. To be honest, is, is the real is the real real point here is I don't really care for people's opinions a lot of the time on, on certain things that I know or slash like. And I think that is something that is harder, and don't get me wrong, it's very hard as a as a younger kid to to kind of instill because we all in some ways conform to some sort of peer pressure, especially when you're growing up. But I just think it's very that's one one thing I always said is very important very very important that you understand who you are and what you want to achieve and what you want to do in life because those same people who are saying all these things will be i'm, I'm, I'm sad to say it, but i won't say it bluntly will will be nowhere to be seen in in those the next year so if you're going around following these people or you're getting dragged out of people or you're you're around people um who aren't really understanding what you're trying to achieve then you can end up in a predicament where you lose faith in what you're trying to do the other thing I'd also say is the people around you are very important. Like, um, so making sure you have a core group of people uh, who are around you, who actually um, have positivity, actually want you to succeed as well, because you can very easily get yourself into a negative sphere where, so, where you want to pursue something. It could be anything. I don't know. You want to be, you want to be a ballerina. I don't know. You want to be a, a tr- and people be like, if the first thing you, when you say that someone says to you is, oh, how are you going to do that? Or that's not really possible. That's a problem in itself. And I would very bluntly, that, 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 is, that is a problem in itself in terms of your friendship group and the people you're speaking to. Because their first motive should never be to crush someone's idea. The first motive should be to help build on someone's idea. Tell us a bit about the the mission at Audio Mob, and and what it was like transitioning from Google uh, to to Audio Mob and setting up your own thing. I can't say anything bad in terms of my experience at Google, but I always knew I wanted to start my own thing, and I always knew to, knew I wanted to have my own company. So that was something that was very important for me. And I ended up meeting my co-founder in the Google Dublin office, um, uh, Christian. Um, and and for me, what was very important is understanding that I always wanted to have my own thing, um, and that I think once you understand that and you and you knew I always knew it, it's like even though Google does all of those things for you, there was still that missing element where I was thinking, well, I'm doing all of this and I'm building all of this for someone else. Um, I'm not building this for my own uh, company or my 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 own establishment. And that's not to say everyone needs to, I'm not one of those, don't worry, I'm not one of those entrepreneurs that comes and tells people everyone needs to be an entrepreneur and all of that jargon, to be honest, that nonsense. Um, because different people have different personalities and certain people don't want to take that risk. And that's absolutely fine. Um, so I'm not here to tell you that. But for me personally, what I'm saying is that that was very, uh, very important um, in terms of uh, the ownership piece. So I ended up, um, after we secured investment for Audio Mob. I um, left Google to um, to uh, start Audio Mob full time. So we originally got an investment of seven hundred and fifty thousand, but this was after that. I, I need to caveat this very deeply because everyone's like, "Oh, that's very good," but it's like there's also the, the, a bit where I think is very important is there was we spoke to almost thirty investors, and the majority of them said no, and even the one that said yes said no originally, until we came back to them uh, three months later with. Um, more um, examples and uh, more plans. Um, so yeah, that, that is, uh, that's a real big one um, in terms of understanding that. And I think that that was part of my, men- my mentoring that I got was, which is another key piece of advice. So the, the, the first piece of advice is that leadership is a lonely journey. And then the other piece of advice was that um, there's no such thing as failure, only feedback. So even though 30 of those investors said no, what, we, what I was always asking them was the reasoning for why they said no for putting investment in. And it was always around, how can you be defensible? So how can someone else not come in and copy your idea and do it? What makes your team special around executing this idea? All of those kind of things um, were, was, the, was the key, the key, the key markers. Um, we even had investors telling us um, this, will, uh, this will make some money, but it's not gonna, make, uh, it's not gonna be a, a big thing or a big changing thing. So you're going to hear all of that um, 
But as, as I said from the beginning, the reason, one of the reasons I'm proud to be born and raised in a council state is because you're told this your whole life. So what difference does someone in a shiny suit say it to me? I don't make it, don't make no difference to me. Um, it just, it's just the same rhetoric that I'm just gonna ignore slash end up embarrassing you with when, when you have to eat those words. What are some of your uh, top tips for for building a sustainable startup? Because it's one thing to have a really good idea, but execution is always is always going to be the hard the hard part. So what I was saying was um yeah so what you want to do is make sure you have a um something small and scrappy like for example our our particular um our particular integration um or our particular product. We had a very scrappy MVP and honestly it only worked 25% of the time. So like even when we were doing pitches, it was like really scrappy. It was a little demo that literally showed an audio ad that could be played in a game. And it 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 was not, it was like the most if I showed you, you'd probably be surprised we got 750000 pounds of investment. But the 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 point is a lot of these investors, you're you're trying to show what you what it could be. It isn't about what it is. And I think that's what people get confused. That's my first piece of advice. Everyone's trying to shoot for the moon um, these days in terms of the most flashy thing to show. But what you, you actually have to work in opposites. It's like, if you think about it, what you want to show is that you have something, it's small and scrappy, but you you actually can show people actually want it. So that that's my first piece of advice in terms of um, uh, when it comes to uh, building stuff and getting uh, investment. Is yeah, very being very mindful of that. Um, the other thing you asked me is like how scaling and being successful is also um, being very cautious of um, team culture um, as well and making sure that uh, you have you actually build in a company um, uh, that is actually people would be attracted to and you'll not have a culture which is toxic or vermin. So when I say toxic, it can be in multiple ways. Like you, you expect people to work all sorts of hours. Cause I, I hear so many people who start businesses and the way they talk to us disturbs me in terms of they're like, oh, you must work all of these hours. I work all continuously. Like honestly, I, I'm bluntly speaking, working a long amount of hours, yeah, is not an indicator of you doing anything. I, I bluntly like, I'm not an advocate slash fan of this work hard idea because I think it's actually very, um, in a way, condescending to working class people, one. Two, I also find it a lie, <laughs> to be blunt, because if you can tell me how many people in banking or how many people I've met at Google who, when you ask them how they got their job role, it's through a referral from a family friend who already works there, is that per se working hard? Or the fact that some people who go into many of these universities are getting uh, their essays and stuff written for them. Is that per se working hard? So this is where I always say, for me, I, I'm not an advocate of people working hard. I'm always advocate of people working smart. What are some of the trends um, you think we should look out for? Um, I don't think there's been any great, well, they not even think, there's never been any greater time for you to have access to the information you need and for you to also make money like we could we are all practically making money virtually anyway now um and again the pandemic again proved another point for for, for, for the people for the naysayers around um can people work without being in the office i guess we have to have done that for the past year haven't we so um so that that is that's another another myth that's been debunked um so for me i i, I always i'm a advocate of saying there's so many ways you can you can actually um make money these days um and there's so many trends you're seeing from cryptocurrency and nfts and from to that to, to if social media influencers that to, to people um running marketing uh, companies online that we were making logos people going on fiverr and making money people making courses on something that they are experts in and making 100k a year of that just their courses, residual income, something they've recorded once and they just continuously sell. Like there, there is so many ways I could give you to make money online. It's actually becoming a joke. That the, that I, I honestly think there's so many trends I'm seeing. Um, the intersection of tech in everything is inevitable. Now, the reason I'm so passionate about it though, is I think our community is definitely getting left behind. And that, there's no two ways about this. And it's partly because a lot of, because of historically, as I mentioned earlier, that tech has been seen as this nerdy thing that why would I get into this? This is only for people who are, 
who are really into computers and stuff. So our community is getting left behind in terms of you're seeing stuff like bias in algorithms um, because of this, because of the fact that if I input the data from the criminal prosecution system from America, and then I use that as my model for my AI technology, what do you think is going to come out? And what has been proven to come out is that it favors people um, who are Caucasian. In the in in the in the level of sentence they're given versus people who are black, and that is that in some ways for me is quite ironic because it just shows it, it, it's not actually technology's fault. It's a reflection of the society that the data has been given tells you that there's bias in it. But the reason why that's important is we need more people who look like ourselves in these decision making places. And the other issue is, like tech is the, one of the highest paying jobs that you can actually get. Um, and the problem is not a lot of us are in it. So, and the jobs that it's creating, I'll be fair and be frank and be honest, it's destroying other jobs. So that Amazon store I mentioned that you can go into and it uses a camera and then it detects your face and it automatically can um, uh, push payment through to your credit card uh, based on what they have on file. It's gonna destroy any need for you to have uh, a checkout person. And you've already seen that. If you go to Asda, Sainsbury's, any store, more and more and more, half of the store is becoming checkouts and then only two people on the counter and desk. And who are usually in the working class jobs? The ethnic minorities. So this is where my passion for technology and actually making people in our community realize there's a paradigm shift that you're not aware of happening. And you you need to actually be on the journey. And the, the, I'll, I'll be honest, the, what I'd say is resistance is actually futile. Like it, I, the, way, the way I always think about this problem and I'm always like, what can we do to solve it? And I'm really, I just, you come to the same, um, uh, you, you come to the same predicament and the same, the same conclusion that there is no real stopping it. This is a one way train to, to us going that way. And I, I, one thing, I, the only thing we can hope, not even hope for, the only thing we need to ensure happens is checks and balances, is making sure we are in and part of that journey so it doesn't go too far the other way before we, we have to recline. So that, that's, that's some of the um, things I'm noticing. Other than that, there's this paradigm shift in terms of people actually understanding the worth of their data. That's another paradigm shift that's actually happening. Uh, there's stuff outside of uh, tech, if you like, where there's uh, you're noticing nation states are becoming a bit more fragile, if you like, in terms of their politics and their, um, and their economies, which is another interesting one. Um, and another just general one I've been noticing is that income and just disparity between groups of people is going worse, but no one really wants to talk about it. Um, and and that's, that for me, sadly, can only be solved by one way, and that's our communities learning that we need to be part of these kind of, these waves and also pull resources together. But the only way you can pull resources together is if you actually have resources, right? So this is why I'm always passionate about the start of this needs to be that we need to start getting into the jobs and bands and, and, and companies where we can actually have more disposable income. So that's another trend I'm, I'm realizing. And I think certainly the group conscious is moving towards that. We have a few bad eggs, but we'll, we'll weed them out eventually. But I think um, for the most part, our community is understanding that that shift needs to happen um, before we can actually start having collective um, investment, for example and collective prosperity in our communities and not just getting gentrified out of our communities. Mm -hmm.